Hello everyone, my name is Achilles and welcome to the channel. Today we will be going over the Greek mythology iceberg. Greek mythology has always been like a fun and interesting topic for me to talk about, so I thought I would cover it here. I found this iceberg picture on Reddit, it's about like 2 years old, but I thought it would be pretty interesting to talk about. This video has been in the making for a while, this is actually like my 4th time filming and editing it. I had one ready up to like ready to go, but I wasn't satisfied with the result, so here we are again. Yeah, but if you guys do enjoy these types of videos, consider subscribing because I post content like this similar every single week and I try my best to just provide that type of material to you guys. Yeah, but that's pretty much it. My name is Achilles and I hope you guys enjoy the video. But before we do dive into the iceberg, I feel like I need to explain what Greek mythology is to the people that just don't know what it is. But do not worry because I looked it up on Google. Google defines it as a major branch of classical mythology. Greek mythology is the body of myths originally told by ancient Greeks and a genre of ancient Greek folklore. If you still didn't understand what that meant, it basically means Hades, Zeus, Athena, demigods, rituals, heroes, all that stuff. So yeah, now that we know what Greek mythology is, let's dive into the first layer. We're going to start away from the top and work our way all the way down to the bottom. So yeah, let's go. Zeus being a good father. What this is referring to is how Zeus may be a good father, but other than that, I couldn't find any more about this because later on in the iceberg, you will come to soon realize that Zeus is actually a terrible father. I could explain why Zeus is one of the worst parents ever right now, but I'm going to save that for later down on the iceberg. But yeah, I don't really know why this is on the iceberg, but um, maybe it has to do something with modern time Zeus, who knows. Olympians are benevolence gods. So for those that don't know, benevolent means well-meaning and kindly. This is referring to how Olympian gods are benevolent in modern times and how they are completely portrayed differently from the original mythology. Uh, I won't get too much into detail on how the gods actually act, but this entry is talking about how shows and medias um, display the gods as benevolent when in reality, well, you'll see. Disney's Hercules. This is literally talking about Disney's Hercules. I, I guess Hercules is, in a, is like in a Disney film, but... Other than that, I couldn't find really much about like else about it, so yeah. The Riodinverse. The Riodinverse is the universe that Percy Jackson series takes place in, and it's called that because the creator of Percy Jackson is called Rick Riordan. The Riodinverse is basically an expanded universe that is based around Greek mythology and demigods, and the fans of Percy Jackson just call it that. Wonder Woman. If you didn't know, Wonder Woman is based on Greek mythology. They took a lot of elements from Greek mythology to make her character in DC Universe, known as Diana. She takes elements from goddesses like Artemis and Athena and many others, but yeah, all this is referring to is how she's based off Greek mythology. Clash of the Titans. Clash of the Titans was a film made back in 2010. This film is based off Greek mythology and this is honestly my first time hearing about this film, but let me read you guys a quick summary of the movie just in case you're interested. Perseus, the son of Zeus, is caught in a war between gods and is helpless to save his family from Hades, the god of the underworld. With nothing else to lose, Perseus leads a band of warriors on a dangerous quest to prevent Hades from overthrowing the king of the gods and laying waste to earth. Now, this film is not Greek mythology accurate if you're looking for that, but I guess it's entertaining to watch if you're interested in the mythology. 300 300 was a movie made back in 2006, and it's a classic movie that I'm sure most of you have watched, but for you that haven't, uh, let me explain what it's about. It's about the 300 Spartans that go into a state of war between Persia and Greece. The Spartans are led by Eleonidas, the king of the Greek city, and he leads his 300 Spartans into war. And yeah, I don't want to spoil it, but you get the gist. This film is also not mythology accurate, nor does it have like any insane plot to it, but it's an entertaining action film nonetheless. Blood of Zeus. I did not know this show existed in Netflix, but it's a Netflix series that was created back in 2020 about Greek mythology. The series revolves the, around the character Heron. Also, I would like to mention that Heron is an original character exclusively made for the show, and he doesn't actually exist in the original mythology but he's like the main character of this show. Heron is basically tasked with saving heaven and earth from a vengeful goddess. I don't really know that much about the show, but it seems cool, I guess, if you're interested about watching like an anime Greek mythology show. Zeus is kind of a dick. 
So, uh, yeah, this is true. Uh, this is what I was talking about. Zeus is kind of a dick, and it's 100% true. Zeus does many, like, questionable actions in the original mythology that you kind of just have to sit there and be like, what the hell is going on? Zeus has cheated on many of his wives, for starters, and he kills mortals for them just looking at him the wrong way. And even worse, Zeus likes to R mortals and goddess, like, all the time. He just doesn't care. Zeus tends to give really bad punishments to anyone that he believes deserves them. Zeus one time even turned into a cloud to seduce a princess. So uh, yeah, I guess you can say Zeus is uh, not a good person. Hades is actually not that bad. Hades is not that bad. And yeah, he's not. Um, in modern times, Hades is portrayed as the bad god and is referred with satanic and evil views. But in the real mythology, Hades is one of the most peaceful gods there are. Hades hardly starts any trouble and whenever heroes come to him, he usually assists them and aids them on their journey. Hades is pretty much neutral in most cases and is he's just like seen as the guardian of the underworld. In fact, most Greeks didn't even bring up his name because they thought it was bad luck so that's why it was hardly mentioned in any of the mythology. So yeah, it's just modern time media portraying the gods differently. Aesop's Fables. This is talking about how this is talking about Aesop's Fables to which he was a slave and a storyteller believed to live in the ancient Greece between 620 and 564 BC. Basically Aesop was a storyteller and he had a bunch of these fables and stories and manuscripts that he wrote. I was looking through them and he has a ton of them but let me tell you one of his like most favorite like famous ones which I'm sure all of you guys are familiar with which is the hare and the tortoise. The story goes that the hare was making fun of a tortoise for moving so slowly. The tortoise grows tired of the hare's jokes about how how slow he is so eventually he challenges the hare to a race then the tortoise ends up winning the race basically going back to that saying um slow and steady wins the race so yeah aesop's fables is just a bunch of stories back in his day god of war i'm sure i don't need to say too much about this one because it's literally one of the most popular games out on playstation right now but i do want to mention that the first three installments of god of war one two and three take place in greek mythology and the newer versions from 2018 and further take place in North mythology. So yeah, just in case people didn't know. Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is another popular franchise that took place in Greek mythology and the game takes place in Greece. But in this game, you play as a Spartan hero and uncover more about your past, sort of like the previous Assassin's Creed games. But yeah, I'm gonna be real with you. I'm gonna go on a bit of, of a, like a rant here. This game sucks. Like the parkour sucks, the combat feels sloppy and the story is just like, what the hell? Ubisoft, what the Zeus is a serious R word. Zeus, like we talked about previously, he's more than often likes to R people. Like Zeus does this a number of times throughout the mythology. But let me point out some names that Zeus has seduced. Callisto, Cassiopeia, Europia, Lo, Metis, Nemesis, Persephone, and many others. That's just females as well. Zeus does this to all genders and things. Like anything that Zeus can get his hands on, he will do. Orpheus and Eurydice. This is a love tale about Orpheus and Eurydice, and it's quite a long one, but I'll try to give a quick summary on what it's about. Orpheus and Eurydice were lovers, and Orpheus was a perfect musician that even the gods loved. Well, one day they were getting married, and one sneaky person despised their love, so he decided to ambush them in the forest. So the both of them took off running from the ambusher, but Eurydice falls into a pit of snakes and gets bitten from a venomous one, like a venomous one, and dies in front of Orpheus. Orpheus, in absolute distraught, asked. To see Eurydice one last time, so he asks his father Apollo to grant him access to the underworld. So Orpheus gets access to the underworld and starts to play his music for Hades, and Hades and many other gods fall in love with his music so much that Hades grants him the chance for his wife to return to the living, as long as he can escape the underworld without looking at Eurydice. So Orpheus accepts the challenge and he starts to make his way out of the underworld, and all he has to do is wait for Eurydice to step into the light for him to see her again. Well, well, at the last second, he turns around at the worst possible moment and Eurydice does not get the chance to step into the light. So Orpheus only sees a glimpse of her. Eurydice is then set back down to the underworld and Orpheus is denied access to seeing her again by Zeus. Um, of course, I just gave a quick summary of it. If you want the exact details, I recommend reading it. It's a great story. How Athena was born. The reason this is on the list is probably because Athena's birth was very, very strange. You see, Athena was born from Zeus and Metis, but in a very odd way. First of all, Zeus feared that Metis' child would have powers that overthrow his. So in order to prevent this, Zeus proceeds to swallow Metis so she cannot give birth to Athena. Well, one day, Zeus was chilling at the top of Olympus and he started to get a real bad headache. So bad that his screams made all the other gods come to his assistance. Well, when Hermes arrives, 
he has the bright idea and say said hey let's cut open his forehead to relieve the headache well when they did this athena came out of zeus's forehead and that's how she was born from zeus's forehead so yeah her birth is like really strange Arachne getting on Athena's nerves. Athena one day heard that Arachne Immortal was boasting about how much better she was than Athena at weaving. So Athena went down to earth disguised as an old lady and approached Arachne. Thinking she was merely talking to some someone insignificant, Arachne boasted once again of her ability and said she would easily challenge the goddess herself if she could. Athena, sick of hearing this, reveals herself as the goddess and challenges Arachne to a weaving challenge. Arachne accepts it and they begin their challenge. Athena creates an amazing piece of artwork of the Greek gods on Mount Olympus and Arachne makes a piece of all the gods abusing their power and them basically at their lowest. This ticks Athena off and she proceeds to turn Arachne into a spider for punishment. And that's where the word arachnophobia comes in from. So if you, yeah, it's pretty cool. And not cool, but what the fuck? Arrows and Scythe. Okay, I'm not going to get too much into detail about this story because it's a love story about Arrows and Scythe. But Arrows was sent to put a spell on Scythe that made no man attracted to her. But instead he pokes her with an arrow that makes her fall in love instantly. And he accidentally pricks himself with the arrow as well. Feeling bad about like what he's done, he gives her a potion that gives her joy in her life. They both fall in love with each other and they go through multiple ways to make it work. Even asking many gods for assistance. And yeah, like I said, I'm not going to get too much into detail about it. It's basically another like love story. Um, I recommend giving it a read. And yes, it does have a happy ending, sadly. Midas Touch. The Midas Touch is referring to the king about, I mean, the story about the king Midas and how he wished for everything that he touched to turn into gold. The way he got this ability was one day Dionysus was passing through the kingdom of Midas and one of his companions named Silenus got tired and collapsed in Midas's garden. And Midas discovered Silenus laying on the floor, so Midas quickly came to his aid and took him back to Dionysus. The god of celebration was so grateful for this act that he promised to grant any wish for Midas, and Midas asked for everything that he touched to turn into gold. Narcissus. Narcissus was a hunter in Greek mythology and was the, hunt, the son of the river god Cephasus. He was a young and beautiful man that many fell for him, but he showed disdain and contempt. Well, one day he was hunting in the woods and a nymph going by the name Echo spotted him and immediately fell for him and attempted to hug Narcissus. However, Narcissus pushed her away and told her not to disturb him. Nemesis, the goddess of the revenge, learned what happened and decided to punish Narcissus. She led him to a pool where he saw a reflection of himself and fell in love with it. However, it was just a reflection of himself, so he understood that he couldn't bring it into the real world. After learning that, he basically, he knew that he couldn't bring his love into to the living so he committed suicide and that's where the word narcissism comes from how aphrodite was born the entry is talking about the birth of aphrodite the goddess of love the way she was born was she emerged naked from the water around cyprus and she had been made from the foam of the sea by cronus castrating his father uranus and throwing his genitals into the water yeah man um i don't know anymore man Medusa's R and Punishment. This is talking about Medusa's R and her whole punishment of it all. So if you did not know, Poseidon was the one to R word Medusa. And the reason he did was to humiliate her in Athena's temple and to break the vow of celibacy that she had taken from Athena. Athena caught word of this and decided to punish Medusa for her act and cursed her with a head full of snakes and any man that looks at her to turn to stone. Sisyphus temporarily making everyone immortal. I don't really know what this is referring to, but I think I sort of have an idea of what it's talking about. You see, Sisyphus received a punishment in the underworld where he is forced to roll a boulder up a hill repeatedly for all of eternity. But Sisyphus doesn't give up and he continues to push the boulder up that hill every time. It falls, it resets, and he is afraid of the consequences that might happen if he were to fail. So he is foolishly believes that after all his failed attempts of pushing the boulder that one day he may make it to the top. So I believe this is just referring to the message that Sisyphus is spreading to the everyone that you can take control of your life and start pushing again and become the hero of your story or it might mean something else but that's all I can find. 
how Erectonius was born. What is up with these weird births that everyone is getting, man? But anywho, the, the way Erectonius was born was a strange one. This all happened when Athena visited the smith god Hephaestus to request some weapons, but he was so overcome with desire that he tried to seduce Athena, I mean Athena, in his workshop. Athena, disgusted, fought him off and struggled in the whole ruckus, but some of his semen fell on her thigh, and in disgust, she wiped it away with her cloth and flung it to earth. And in the process, um, Erectonius was born from the semen that fell to earth. Hermaphroditus. This is talking about the god Hermaphroditus and of Infeminence, and he was the son of Hermes and Aphrodite, the gods of male and female sexuality, but other than that, I couldn't find any more information about this topic other than he was just partly male and female, so that's probably what the subject is referring to. How the Minotaur was born. The way the Minotaur was born was yet another strange birth, but not as strange as I, I, I guess. He was basically an offspring of Pasiphae, the wife of Minos, and after Minos offended Poseidon, he cursed Pasiphae with making her fall in love with a white bull, so then she mated with the creature and gave birth to the Minotaur. Not as bad as the other ones though. There's an Oedipus in all of us. Oedipus was a king who killed his father and married his mother, but was unaware that he killed his father and married his mother because at a young age he was abandoned. This is probably talking about how everyone has some level of ignorance or irony in, th in themselves, because the whole point of the story is that it's built on dramatic irony, and that the one murderer that Oedipus is wa like wants to find is actually himself. So I'm pretty sure it's mentioning how everyone has like Oedipal feelings because everyone lacks knowledge about their own own identity, but I may be wrong. Iliad and Odyssey are based on actual history. This explains why Iliad and Odyssey were based off two events in history. For example, Iliad was in fact written not too long after the Trojan War, and it likely contains real accounts from the war, and Odyssey tends to retell a short story about Hephaestus and the other gods, which is told in a lot of detail with the planetary conjunction that happened in 1953 BC. Now of course the magical fantasy stuff was never real, but some of the characters were based off real people in history. The magical events are just an interesting way to describe floods and diseases that were happening back then, but still most describing the real events. So many believe that a lot of it to be true and Homer was just recreating the events in a more like fancy way. Pretty much everyone is a pansexual freak. This is just saying how everyone in Greek mythology was pansexual and didn't care about each other's genders as long as they got what they want, if you know what I mean. But there's not too much to say here because there's been plenty of scenarios of gods and mortals doing things with different genders, so yeah. Shape-shifting bestiality. Now, this one is true because we have seen that there are plenty of gods that can shape-shift if they please. Zeus and Hermes have shown this example whenever they want to go judge the world, so they shape-shifted into human beggars to blend in, but gods can also shape-shift into beasts. There, there was this one case that Poseidon shape-shifted in Theophane into a sheep, and he shifted himself into a ram. So yeah, this is no surprise, the gods shape-shift whenever the time is needed. Homer is fictional. This is talking about how Iliad and Odyssey were fictional, which goes back to earlier the other topic on whether the Iliad and Odyssey were based off true events, and to be honest, we just don't know. As the story gets older, it's, it gets harder and harder to tell which parts of the story are real. Now of course the fictional fantasy is not real, but I'm talking about the details of the actual story. Even scholars are uncertain whether he even existed, so yeah, I'll just leave it as that. Tantalus Dinner. Tantalus was a person from Greek mythology who was rich and king of Sipilus, but Tantalus Dinner was an event that happened when Tantalus had dinner with the gods and attempted to serve his own son to the gods. So Tantalus wanted to test if the gods really knew everything, so he killed and cooked his own son, Pelops, and planned to serve him to all the gods at dinner. But the gods knew almost immediately, and Zeus became enraged and punished Tantalus to forever go thirsty and hungry in Hades. Pygmalion's a sex doll. 
This is referring to the story of Pygmalion's falling in love with his statue, Galati. In the end of the story, Aphrodite the goddess actually grants Pygmalion's wish and requests to this request that the statue becomes real. This story is is a, like a huge influence for countless adaptations in the modern times and it remains a like a fan like a fascinating myth about love and power, but this entry is just about some dude who fell in love with his statue, except it actually came to life. Eric Sigdon's self-cannibalism. All I can find for this entry is the story of Eric Sigdon's, which goes as followings. Eric Sigdon's was the son of King Triopas and the daughter of Myrmidon. Well, one day, Eric Sigdon's ordered all trees in the sacred grove of Demeter to be cut down, but there was one huge oak tree that was covered with votive wreaths, which essentially is a symbol of every prayer that Demeter had granted, so many of the men refused to cut it down, but Eric Sigdon's did not care, so he grabbed an axe and cut it down himself, but in the process, process he killed a nymph the dryad and in her dying words she cursed Eric Sicthans. The curse was that he was unrelentingly and insanely hungry and the more he ate the hungrier he got. Well one day he sold all his possessions for food but after that he was still hungry so he had no choice but he to like he started eating himself and he started eating himself and by the morning he, there was nothing left he just completely ate himself. So uh, yeah that's the story of Eric Sicthans man he should have listened to his men. The Run Ring is based on the Ring of Gigas. Now in my findings, this has to do with the One Ring with Lord of the Rings, and I'm gonna be real with you, I've never watched Lord of the Rings, so I don't know that much about it. But I believe what it's referring to is how the Ring of Gigas, which is a ring that allows the user to, in Gigas to turn invisible when he pleases, so Gigas, when he had the ring, what he did with the ring was he goes to the palace to seduce the, the queen and kills the king, Candelus, to seize the throne. Now in Lord of the Rings, there is this ring called the One Ring or the Ruling Ring, which is to control the other rings of power and domination of the wills of the user. So I'm pretty sure this is just saying how this ring is based off the Ring of Gigas and how they have similar properties. Um, but at the same time, I don't know. I haven't watched Lord of the Rings. Canathos Springs That Restore Virginity Canathos is a place that you can bathe at and restore your virginity. That is literally all I can find about this. Because it's stated that Canathos was the place that Hera the goddess restored her virginity, so essentially she bathed in the spring and she became a virgin again. But that's all I can find about this entry. The Bed of Procasus. Okay, so The Bed of Procasus is a philosophy book by Nasi Nicholas, and it was written and released in 2010, but updated in 2006. According to Nasim, he contrasts the classical values of courage, elegance, and a bunch of other fancy terms. The title refers to Procasus, a figure from Greek mythology who kidnapped travelers <laughs> and stretched and chopped their bodies to fit the length of his bed. So, uh, yeah, let's just move on. Tiresias ranking male and female sex. This is talking about how Tiresias was dragged into an argument between Hera and Zeus on the theme of who has more pleasure in sex. Zeus claims that it's the male and Hera claims it's the woman, but Tiresias claims that he's tried both and gives the following. Of 10 parts, a man enjoys only one. Hera is not pleased with this to hear. She's not pleased with the answer, so she strikes him down with blindness. So she punishes him for saying that and makes him Tiresias blind. Death of King Priam. This is literally talking about the death of Priam. Priam was the last king of Troy during the Trojan War. Priam is killed during the sack of Troy by Neoptolemus. He states that Neo first kills Priam's son right in front of him, and then this makes Priam very mad, so he throws a spear at Neo, but it hits a shield at first. But then Neo drags Priam to Zeus's altar and kills him there, and he even clubs Priam's corpse with his grandson's corpse, so they're together, so uh, yeah. Sword of Damocles. This is referring to a phrase that basically means that something terrible is going to happen to you. The origin began when Damocles was talking to his king Dionysus and explaining to him how much wealth he has and how much fortune he has. In response, the king offers Damocles to swap positions in life for a day. Damocles quickly accepts and takes a seat at the king's throne, admiring the luxury surrounding him. But Damocles notices that there is a sword dangling by a thread above the throne, above him. And Di Dionysus, the king, explains to Damocles the sense of being a king and constantly having to watch for fear and anxiety against 
against dangers, which is why he arranged to have a sword dangling above the throne. Damocles begs to be allowed to depart because he no longer wants to be so fortunate, so basically the phrase just means that something bad is going to happen to you. Terius and Procne. The Terius and Procne is a weird story because, I don't know, it's just strange I guess. But from what I found, Terius was a thrashing king. He once desired his wife's sister, Philomela, so he went to Athens and asked his father-in-law, Pandion, for his other daughter, stating his wife, Procne, was dead. But in reality, Procne wasn't dead. He soon later forced himself upon Philomela on a mountain and cut out her tongue so she couldn't tell anyone. Procne soon came wary of this and killed her son, Itzis, and attempted to serve Terius's own son to him in revenge. When Terius learned of this, he soon pursued the sisters to kill them, but comes to find find out they're all changed by the Olympian gods and turn into birds out of pity. Thanes is literally a firstborn. Before I talk about this, I feel like I need to explain what primordial gods are. A primordial god is the first and one of the strongest gods to ever be made in Greek mythology. Now, why do I bring this up? Because this is talking about Thanes, and Thanes is literally the first god of the universe. Thanes was hatched from the cosmic egg and is the god of creation and life. Thanes was the first primordial god of creation in Orphic cosmology. He was the generator for all life and is the mix of elements consisting of parts Kronos and Anake. Thanes was the first king of the universe. We might be past the fifth age. So in order to understand this entry, you first need to understand what the ages are in Greek mythology are. First is the golden age. That falls within the rule of Cronus and created by immortals who live on Olympus. Next, we have the silver and bronze age. During this age, men refused to worship the gods and Zeus destroyed them for pity pretty much. But then Zeus recreated these humans out of the ash tree. And this was the time where wars were created out of passion and purpose. After that, we have the Age of the Heroes. This age does not correspond with any metal and is the only age that gets better after the previous age, but it was the heroes of this age who at uh, Thebes and Troy pretty much during those wars. Finally, we have the Iron Age, the most brutal one of them all, where modern men are created by Zeus as evil and selfish as possible and the most troublesome for work and living. Now, I couldn't really find any facts or theories saying that we might be living past the fifth age, so I guess it's just this thing, like this fun thought to think about Pandora's box is actually empty. This is a theory where Pandora's box is actually empty instead of having any powers left in it. Quick sidetrack, I just want to mention that Pandora's box is actually a jar. It's just that over time people alter the story so now people think it's a box but people still speculate that the jar of Pandora is empty even though she states that one thing is still left in it which is hope. Many but many say that because she opened it in one time in mankind's history that everything must have escaped from the jar even the power of hope which still drives in people's bloods today. The mythology claims that hope is the only thing remaining in the jar, but people are still skeptical till this day. Nyx is the mother of all evil. Is Nyx the mother of all evil? No and yes. Let me explain. Nyx is not evil and ruthless, rather she is more one of the more neutral goddesses, and she doesn't punish mortals nor like mock them in their actions. Nyx is one of the, the primordial gods who was created at the dawn of creation and she is the goddess of the night. So why do I say that she is not but maybe the mother of all the evil? Well it's because Nyx has immense power that even Zeus does not want a piece of her. She is capable of causing like great evil and has the power to create such chaos but never does. She never has done anything truly evil to mark her as evil but she certainly can if she wants to. Abrahamic God is based on Kronos. There are many similarities with the God of Abraham and Kronos. As you guys might not know, Kronos is the God of time and Abraham is a Jewish prayer in Yiddish. I guess the way they are similar is because the way they're depicted, they can both be seen pretty similar, I guess, in a way. You can call them both destroyers, kind of. Kronos was destructive and defeated Gaia, so Rhea, his wife, can give their children as soon as they were born. Abraham wanted to sacrifice the children to form Isaac. Other than that, I really couldn't find any more information about this. Um, I don't even know what this is like saying, I guess. Anarchy is the reason for everything. Anarchy is the primordial goddess of necessity and fate. She is also created at the dawn of creation. The reason it says that Anarchy is the reason for everything is because Anarchy is the goddess of fate. Before Anarchy and Kronos, it was only chaos, a mass with no purpose or order. Anarchy was that order that was needed to create. She is unavoidable. No matter what measure were taken, nothing could avoid Anarchy. She was the god of purpose, pretty much. Anarchy was little influence on the Greek 
worldview, but she without a doubt was one of the strongest gods there is in Greek mythology. So that's why many believe that she is the reason for everything. Hope is the greatest evil. Now, this topic is very difficult to talk about, but hope in Greek mythology is the strongest weapon ever to be made, and it's kept in Pandora's jar. Along with hope stored all the evils in the world were all trapped in the jar. When Pandora opened the jar, all the evils flew out immediately and began to plague mankind with all evil emotions that we know today. Well, once Pandora closed the jar back up, it's said that she managed to contain one evil inside, which was hope. Wait, hope isn't evil, right? Well, let me explain now. It was believed that it was believed by the Greeks that hope was the most pernicious of all evils because it was it prevented people from accepting their fate. For example, if a prisoner was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, they tend to adjust better at prison than when a prisoner does have a chance at parole. They accept their fate as hopeless and thus learn to be content. But now this just comes down to the person. Do they want to give up? Do they really want to keep going? Is there really a heaven to rest at? Does God want us to dwell and lose our minds to accept our fate? You see where this is going? Now, I'm not a very educated and like about, I'm not really like educated about religion and life, but I do want to leave my take on this. I believe there is always a reason to keep going, no matter, nobody should ever give up on hope at the end of the day. At the end of the day, it's what keeps us going. There are always new challenges and mountains to reach every day. There is always a reason to keep going. Chaos is order. Yes, chaos is 100% order. It's almost like the Big Bang Theory. Chaos was the first thing to exist, and after that day, day and night was made. Chaos is sort of the gap between heaven and earth in Greek mythology. Chaos is the mythological void state preceding the creation of the universe. You see, chaos and order are transitionary. They both are the balance to process of the universe. Chaos exists in order, and order is in chaos, because everything is in constant chaos in order for everything to change. So pretty much chaos is order and order is chaos. And what this tells us is that chaos Chaos itself has an order even within chaos. Did you get that? Balance pretty much. Chaos is order. Order is chaos. Complete balance. And that was the iceberg. Hope you guys enjoyed. I'm not gonna lie with some of these topics that are quite like some of them are stories some of them are self-explanatory some of them are weird you know but i did try my best to explain it to you guys that in the best of my ability so if you, if you guys didn't understand it i apologize next time i will do better explanation and research but um yeah i hope you guys enjoyed the video uh this video has been in the process for a while now so it means a lot to me for anyone who sticked around to the end so uh, yeah that's the iceberg please subscribe if you enjoy this type of content but um now i have to get to editing because yeah Okay, bye.